listening to the Lydian Spin. Tim Dahl is away from us, but he will be back momentarily, I'm sure. I bet he can smell us from wherever he is, and we smell delicious. I bet he's drooling. I'm here with Michelle Handelman, photographer, videographer, filmmaker, performance artist, professor, tenured professor, multimedia artist. And again, as we've talked about in the past, you know, there's so much connective tissue in the Lydian spin. When did we first meet, Michelle? Do you remember? I don't, but <laughs> I know we it must have been San Francisco. It was. I remember first meeting you in probably in 1993. I was living in San Francisco, and I was with Monty Cazaza. One of my favorite people in the entire world, the unsung king of genius thought, not very productive as we'd like him to be, but his thoughts actually radiate out of his head. Let's just talk a little about Monty for one second. He actually is considered by some to be the godfather of industrial music. Well, actually, he came up with the term industrial Hello. music. So, yeah, he coined the term along with Robin Gristle when they were putting together all of their music. And, you know, of course, if Monty was here, he would say, Just where's you, my money? Well, where's my money? <laughs> well, but I mean, you were with Monty for 10 years, but we met. And how did we, did we meet through V. Vale, or how did we meet? I think Vale brought you over to our house. And that would be V. Vale of research books. Yeah, and we were living in this godforsaken town called Rodeo, which was on the oh. bay. But it was this old oil refinery town full of junkies and speed freaks. And chemical factories. And chemical factories, exactly. Okay, now again, the tissue that connects is so bizarre here because you went to the San Francisco Art Institute. I taught at the San Francisco Art Institute for one semester, but I think it was maybe the year after. I don't think we were there at the same time. I don't think we were there at the same time either, but I was a total college delinquent took me you know I was I was in and out of four colleges before I ever got a degree and well, so I'm amazed that you got a degree I'm a high school dropout but you got a degree I stuck with it for some reason it just seemed like it made sense because it gave me access to all of this film equipment Correct. and it was too expensive to buy film equipment back who then. was the main guy at the San Francisco Art Institute at that time Tony do you remember him Tony Labatt Tony Labatt See, I taught there because Karen Finley got pregnant, so they asked me. And then consequently, I moved to not San Francisco, but really to Richmond, which is right near Rodeo, which is also one of the most polluted areas. Like when we think of the Bay Area, we think of, oh, uh, health food and Muir Woods, but really uh, Manhattan Project, bomb makers, Berkeley, and 350 petrochemical factories. It's That's the, what we were breathing. It's the cancer belt of California. And also there was that small town Hercules, which was right in between Richmond and Rodeo, which is where the Hercules... We were separated by Hercules. <laughs> Gunpowder factory started during World War I and World War II. So it's loaded with, with carcinogenic chemicals. And people don't realize how filthy and how much filth actually came out of Berkeley. And I'm not just talking Birkenstocks. I'm talking <laughs> the Manhattan Project. I'm talking debris that has given us more cancer than any country probably in the world. San Francisco has this very sinister underbelly. And everyone thinks of San Francisco as the city of love and all these hippies uh, and everyone's and 60s, really yeah. nice. And, and even back then, it was a cesspool of drug addicts and psycho killers. Psycho pornography, which brings us to your dad. Quickly, I don't know why, but <laughs> it's interesting <laughs> because there fast, I was well. But. I was saying the other day that um, women that have crazy fathers usually become artists and articulate. Men that have crazy mothers become serial killers. Now, are we serial artists? <laughs> I guess so, because it's never enough, is it? But that's one of the themes you address in your work. That's true. Yeah, my father, who was a working class Jew from the south side of Chicago in the late 1960s, became enlightened, so to speak, and went off the grid and 
took a pit stop in Provincetown, which is where I, at a ripe age of eight or nine, got introduced to the world of homosexuality and all of its beautiful first, glory. Okay, well, your yeah. first exposure, so to say. You must have loved it, because it must have just looked like a costume ball. Totally. I loved it so much. And I got my first pair of platform shoes there and was walking around, you know, like this oh, little we, kid with a tube top and hot we pants. We were already weird at eight or nine. Absolutely. That's what people, I mean, we were already weird by nine. <laughs> uh, that's <laughs> when I started reading Edgar Allan Poe. And, and, at, and at 12 was when I started reading Desaad and Hubert Selby and Henry Miller. And it's like, how did we even find these books? Well, your mother was an artist. My mother was almost autistic. Well, no, my mother was not an artist, but she was married to art. Oh, she was married. On. My mother was the quintessential housewife and mother and just took was she care of the home. She, I, you know, I don't know if she had a little mother's little helper, but she certainly needed it after my father. So my father, who then hits the road and breaks up, loose, breaks loose, ends up in Los Angeles, 1972, with running a massage or, parlor. With you or without you? Oh no, he left okay. everyone behind. He, took he left to the high the, road. Oh yeah, he left the kids, the mom. He took to the road. Well, you know, really, I, I have to say, I can't blame men from leaving families because they should have never had them in the first place. I mean, of course, we were born, and thanks, Dad, for your sperm count. The nuclear family is so outdated, and then nobody teaches anyone how to be parents, and I can't blame anyone for leaving. I don't understand why more women don't leave. Well, I think my dad was running from the law at the time because there were some insurance like my scams okay. and some bank robbery situations in my family. And so he ends up running this massage parlor with a Butch Dyke partner named JD and a pimp named Suleiman. And that became his life, 1970s. He must have been in heaven. Hollywood. Pimp heaven. Sold every drug you could think of. I'm sorry my dad didn't meet him because my dad went to massage parlors. He should have owned one. You're right. Your dad did the right thing. So sold every drug, but you're where now? You're in Chicago with mom? I'm in Chicago. I'm in the boring white middle class suburbs of Chicago losing with mom your nine, and my brother. Losing my mind. Looking for Edgar Allan Poe books. <laughs> And every moment I could, every vacation I could, I went to go live with my dad because I was daddy's girl. And so I was selling drugs for my dad. I was his mule, you know, like no one mule would... Mule and muse. No one would think that a the little nine-year-old nine nine had a bunch of cocaine up in her, her bag. Wah, wah, woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't stuff it up my wah, wah, woo, well, woo honey, at that age. Sometimes I still have to. I know. I hate to admit it, but I have to. <laughs> I waited. Yeah, all right. Okay, well... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always request a body search, but they never do it. I don't understand what's wrong with TSA. <laughs> so, so, you were one, so already you had a taste from such an early age of what you wanted to pursue, which was outlandish sex, drugs, weirdos, people that like to dress up, um, alter sexuals, and you already had it in your blood. You already knew. Yeah. We already knew at that age what we were going to pursue. So back and forth between mom and dad. Then what? The boring years in the outskirts of Chicago in your teenage years, but now your mind's awake. Yeah, and so I would go Pursuant. down to the city as much as I could and go to pimp stores. I don't know if you remember this during the well. 60s, of course, and I'm sure it, it might have been the same in upstate New York, but there were these pimp stores in Chicago that you had to be buzzed into. And that's where they sold all the great clothes, you know? Oh. All these great, like, long fake fur coats. And I had to have, have a the pair platforms. of Honey, red I know what snake you're gonna skin say. platforms. How did I know what you're going to say? So, I could see it coming. I saved How my money. How many pairs of platforms? I mean, as many as possible, please, in those days. Yeah. Yeah, so I would, you know, just hop on the train and go on to the city and just try to, you know, get into some trouble and check out all of these places and buy clothes that so I would hide. So how was your mom at letting you go out at such an early age? Did you say, as I did, it's for my career? As my mother would say, what career? <laughs> I'm like, you'll see. No, I wasn't that progressive. I just said I was going to the library. Oh, smarty pants, <laughs> smarty pants. 
I was lucky because dad rogue as he was, for some reason, probably out of guilt for his insane sexual behavior, would take me to all the rock concerts, I mean, at 12, 13, 14, and pick me up at like 2 o'clock in the morning. Mother, for my career. And it was true. We needed those platforms. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you know, I saw, my dad took me to see Janis Joplin Holy on my moly. ninth birthday. Oh, God. And... She was my idol. You know, I wanted to be up there on stage with a bottle of whiskey being pulled off the stage and my hair flying around. And- well, again, here we go with these weird coincidences. One time in San Francisco, when I wasn't living there, I actually fucked somebody on Janis Joplin's quilt. And that was at Mark <laughs> McLeod's house. You know who Mark McLeod yes. is. We hope to get him on the podcast. Mark McLeod it was the acid king or at least the acid art king of San Francisco, and a professor. So you saw Janis Joplin at nine. Glory. 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 Also went to a lot of the riots that were happening around the Republican convention at that time. Uh, I think my father and my brothers took me. We went to Grant Park to see Sly Stone, who, of course, never showed up because that's what he was doing back then. So I was in the midst of the riots. My home from the age of one to ten there were the race riots of 64 and 67 right in front of my house. I didn't have to go to them. They came to me. Here we go. And those things imprint you forever. You know, they and form they, you, and- they form you and you understand. You might not understand that moment who you are, but you know what direction they you need to go They imprint rebellion in you. We've known each other for a long time, but what's bizarre is we haven't had as much contact as either of us, I'm sure, would have liked, but we have so many parallels, as we've just been discussing. We're Repscallion youngsters. We know already that we're going to do something. We might not know exactly what it was, and we knew that not only music, but the riots and the failure, in my opinion, of the 60s somehow inspired us to rebel through art and to rebel just through sex as well. We both had kind of psychosexual dads Mm -hmm. who were a bit outlandish by anybody's standards. So I think that, you know, these parallels, all right, you go to the San Francisco Art Institute. Amen. You're around the equipment you need. Did you always know you wanted to make films? No. What did you think you were going to do? You know, when I was in high school really thinking about, okay, what am I going to do? I thought I would be a civil rights attorney. And what's amazing is you kind of are a civil rights, attorney's not the right word, but you're a civil rights protester. Yeah, well, that's where it came from. I knew early on, like, you need to right the wrong somehow. Not that I naively believe that's possible anymore, but I just knew I needed to fight for a better world in some way. And so... I quickly realized, like, I could never be a lawyer. I'd never handle the dress code. (laughs) All the honey, you look sexy (laughs) even in a suit, I'm sure. No biggie. Yeah, but we knew. Yeah, but I knew. knew We had to do something. Mm -hmm. And And also, I mean, I don't know if you felt like I did, because by the age of 12 or 13, look, we're reading all these books, and they're mostly written by men. Let's face fact. And a lot of your work has historical references. We'll go into that in a minute. But we're inspired by a lot of dead white men because what we eventually went on to create or to document, really, there weren't many female precedents before that. And we came to deal in a lot of the same subjects. We came to deal, and I love that quote you have about looking for transcendence through transgression. Mm -hmm. You know, we both were dealing with uh, we, we are outsiders. We're dealing with outsiders. We are born out of rebellion. You thought, and you did become, in some ways, a civil rights activist. So now you have all this equipment in San Francisco. What happens? It started out doing self-portraits in my living room, actually. There was this urge to perform, but a total fear of the stage. Ah, All right, I'm going to tell you my secret. What is your secret? The first time I was going to the stage, Teenage Jesus, 16 or 17, and of course, you've never been on stage before, except for an acid party at 14, you're like, panic. But the minute I said, wait, panic? My job is to make other people panic. I never had stage fright again. But how do we know that? I don't know. Some of us did. 
I'm going to remember that next time I step on a stage. Because, because I mean, you're right. You're here to do a job. Right. And, and so you still feel some kind of, I know that you, that I've read about, that you really obsess about your projects. Like they do not leave your mind. Once they're in there, they're a contaminant that you have to basically undo and impregnate people with a positive view of very dark things. If I may paraphrase. That's fantastic. And I'm glad we're recording this so I can steal that and use that <laughs> hey, next time I need I've to got talk some about some of my your work. quotes right here, honey. Absolutely. But I would say maybe not leave them with a positive view. Leave them questioning. Right. And most importantly, questioning themselves. Not questioning what I'm saying, but questioning where they are in this world and how they relate to the world. Okay, and that's how we differ because I like to leave people questioning what I'm saying. Because I feel I speak in triplicate. I don't have a fork tongue. I have a triple fork tongue. Do I really mean what I'm saying? Am I being sarcastic or do I mean the opposite? And first and foremost, even though it's brute poetry, I have to use poetry in the same way where you're dealing with extreme subjects, but you bring such beauty. The palette is so beautiful when you're dealing with these really heavy subjects. So, so I want to go back to your nervousness. Yeah, oh. Okay, my nervousness. Yeah, so I was terrified of the stage. I forced myself to get up there a few times. Naked but, often. And of course, well, actually, I did learn that when you're naked in public, it's a very powerful position. It terrifies other people more than it does you, I think. Absolutely. People are freaked out. So I would set up these tableaus in my living room with a bunch of bones and raw meat and shards of broken glass. A bit of Herman Nietzsche, a little bit of Chris Burton, and maybe a Nias Nin in the writing room. You got it. All of that thrown in there. And, uh, you know, and then I get naked and maybe spread some body paint on me, maybe not, and start to pose myself with all of this stuff. And so nervous at first, but then you're naked and now you feel empowered. I've always loved being naked. I've always loved wearing costumes and high heels in bed, but... You're not talking about in bed anyway. You're talking about in art. <laughs> well, yes, in art. Because, because there was this rawness. As much as I deal with beauty and the surface, I do that because I feel surfaces are very deep. And so you have to go deep. The surface itself is deep. Because you have to it's dig a covering. shallow grave before you can get to the, the seven circles of Dante. Exactly. I don't know. I just made that up, but it sounded pretty good. <laughs> it does. And so being naked is this rawness. I mean, I've been naked out. on stage only once, well, 10 times when I was doing my play South of Your Border, where I was crucified naked, bleeding and pissing. And that felt pretty good. But Body parts must be shown in some of the films I've done. I think right now, like, nudity is often, in performance art, has been overplayed, but not necessarily the way that you've done it, especially when you're on the floor on all fours licking candy. <laughs> kind of cute. <laughs> kind of cute there, honey bunny. I don't know. Because it's compulsion. That's what right. that piece was about. It was right. compulsion and obsession. And I just had to do it, and I couldn't stop, and I just set the camera because up. Because we and are I was all obsessive. Alone, but I had to do it. Because yeah. we are obsessive. And that's what so much of your work deals with. It deals with the fact that, that I, this is so the American condition. For instance, in the Dark Matter short, which I love, it's beautiful because, first of all, who is portraying the actress? That is Zachary Drucker, and what you saw was a short clip from, from a longer piece called Irma Vep, The Last Breath, and it's the end where she starts to talk about dark matter. Which is so beautiful, and it is so fantastic, because it's really talking about how, and this is, I think, really the American condition, that especially for women or others, or people that have more feminine qualities, not good enough won't be loved enough, no matter what you do is not enough. I've never had those issues because as somebody that's, after killing my male twin, more male uh, energy, but those issues are so important, and especially so many Americans have them, issues of shame, of humiliation, of insecurity, of not good enough. And I think that in a lot of what you're trying to do is illustrate the pain of that, but also that there is, as you say, a transcendence in the right kind of transgression. And by you illustrating it in such a beautiful and haunting way, it really takes it to another place. Well, and a part of the subtext of that as well was Zachary talking about a tr being a transgender woman and that pain 
and that society throws back at you or that ugliness that society throws back at you and that pain that you live with, you have to transcend it. And that's part of the reason why I've always been attracted to drag and worked with a lot of drag performers is because that beauty that they portray is right. so violent. Yes. Because and so it's rooted a, out that, of pain. Uh, rooted out of pain, absolutely. Fuck the pain away, as Peaches once said. But I mean, that is so absolutely true. And I think it's really a big part of what you do, and it's been a big part of what I do as well, is that we're really trying to get to the core essence. Now let's talk about your latest projects. Hustlers and Empires. And I think Neon Music is in that. Isn't she not? Well, Neon has a walk-on role okay. presenting the best silent blowjob you've ever seen on screen. I won't contradict that. I'm sure she does. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about this piece. It's a very, I mean, the thing about your pieces is, is that they're really immense. I mean, they're grand projections, very large scale, multi-screen, multidisciplinary and multimedia. There's words, there's images, there's music. Just give us a little view of what it is for those that haven't seen it and where it's being shown and, and what's going on with it. Kind of hard to describe my work in a lot of ways because it does contain all of those things. At the heart of Well, I think I just described it. You did. You did, you did a great job. It's so. massive. It's beautiful. It's dealing with it's dealing with transcendence through transgression and people coming to terms with their pain and otherness. Exactly. And also looking at transgression as a form of survival. What do you do when you're on the outside, when you live in a society that's been stacked against you? Well, and also that, that is against pleasure. And one of my main mantras has been for years, pleasure is the ultimate rebellion. And I think that that's also what you're trying to show. What's interesting to me is the one piece that I saw, they tried to censor a piece of your work because of somebody's face. We don't even see that he's sticking a butt plug up as where it belongs, but their facial expressions. And again, I mean, censorship against pleasure? Yes. Censorship is something I come up against a lot. See, and when, I never and, have, which is surprising, but then again, I'm maybe more underground, but go ahead. Probably, because in the art world, there's all of these stupid elitist gatekeepers that want to tell you what and what you can't do. I only work with people, curators who believe in my work, and so they don't care. But then some, some someone snitch. on the board, someone comes some and, and shuts down a piece. Over the look on someone's face. Yeah, so that piece in particular, it was really interesting because it was the president of the board of directors who came in after seeing the piece and said, shut what it down. What was the piece called? The piece was called Dorian, A Cinematic Perfume, and it was a queer adaptation of Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. And again, back to the fact that you use a lot of historical references in your work, from Baudelaire to Oscar Wilde to Musidora to, okay, so let's talk about this one for a minute. The look on a man's face. The look on a man, flawless Sabrina, the most incredible performer, drag icon. Who's about, what, AS 70s? 70s. Late 70s. Years old. Still active, doing very bizarre performances. Well, Flawless actually just passed away, oh, sadly, right. but had been but performing till, till the very till end. Till the grave, probably still dancing on his own grave. Absolutely. And he and I worked on several projects together. But because I've been censored a lot for various projects, and when it happens now, I confront them and go, what is it? Name it, you know? Right. Uh, it's really important. Like, name it. Name the shot. Name something. Tell me Censoring what it is. the look on a person's face. See, oh, we've come a long way, baby. No, we haven't. Which is why we must continue to do what we do. Exactly. And what it shows you is, so with that piece, when I s said to the curator, when she told me it had been shut down, I'm like, what was it? Yeah. What bothered her? And she goes, it was the bot plug. You didn't. Even see being inserted. That you didn't see being inserted. You see it being slathered up with what looks like shaving cream or whipped cream. It was Crisco. But really slathered <laughs> up. Because the shot that you saw was being slathered. What you don't see before that is the butt plug has been like bedazzled. Right. So it looks Bejeweled. like a Fabergé egg. How did she even know who it was a butt plug? Who doesn't want a Fabergé butt plug? I don't know about you, but <laughs> I'm signing up for one today. 
I should have just marketed those. I you think know? so. Forget but the, the but eggs. But what that reveals is the hypocrisy. What? She knows what a butt plug is. She's used that she butt had, plug She probably before. had one up her suit. And she's, I'm sure, had a lot of pleasure, as you say, again, with that. But she, we have to shut it down because we can't publicly announce that sexuality and sex is a pleasurable act and not just for procreation. I mean, it's fine to have all the violence, murder, uh, sexual mania, mass shootings, violence. There's very little censorship about that. But, and of course, they can't really censor all the pornography that's online right now, uh, whatever that may be, because I don't go there anymore. I'm, I've graduated beyond that. I do my own home movies. But um, you won't be seeing those anytime soon. But, um, yeah, again, pleasure is the ultimate form of rebellion. Yes, it certainly is, because it's taking power and taking what you want. And it's taking what we deserve, and it's taking the first thing that was especially stripped from women, queers, weirdos, outsiders, call them what you will. I don't even know what to call myself because I'm outside of everything. Therefore, I guess I'm outside the outside. You know, because who's the one that's allowed to have all the fun? And what fun is that? I'm not talking about the men we know or every man individually. I'm talking about the patriarchal pleasure in killing, in corruption, in greed, in domination, in controlling whole countries that they should not have anything to fucking do with. And including, let's get down to basics, still the argument about controlling our own bodies. Get out of my fucking uterus. And look at... Genital mutilation, female genital mutilation. Still going on. Still going on. And again, trust me, threaten a man that you're going to stick a Q-tip up his fucking little six-inch flaccid. He is going to faint. Let me just trim that at the tip a little bit right now because you know what? I want you to know how I feel. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Michelle Andelman. We're going to now talk about your latest project. Well, we're going to talk about hustlers. All right, so we'll talk about hustlers right. and empires a little bit right. more. So, so where is that now? It's been it, going around. It was a commission. It was actually commissioned by SF MoMA, the San Francisco which Museum is of Modern fantastic. Art, which was a miracle, and it premiered there last year. If only they would have given you the title, that would have even even been better. <laughs> can you do something called Hustlers and Empire? Yeah, oh. yeah I think I can. <laughs> well, that title was all mine. Of course it was. And that's where we also have crossover because one of my characters was based on the stories and the life and the writings of, of Iceberg, Iceberg Slim. Slim, which we grew up on. Yes. Which when I lived in New Orleans, there was an alley near my house that had Iceberg Slim painted. I have a song called Trick Baby, which quotes Iceberg Slim. Does the connective tissue ever stop? No. Let's hope it continues. Not at all. And here's more connective tissue. So the character in Hustlers and Empires, the pimp character is played by Shannon Funchess, who was the former lead singer of Light Asylum and founder of the band Light Asylum, who is also Neon's best friend and brought Neon into the project as a stylist, not only great oh. blowjob giver on screen, but also a stylist. Neon Music, one of the most beautiful creations this planet has to offer, who another tissue with that is, I did a Lazy Girl exercise video with Neon, and Neon has sampled one of my songs from 1313 in his upcoming recording of Cop Fucker. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> Neon is one of those amazing, very rare, talented, gorgeous human beings. human beings, beautiful inside and out. Yeah. And, and so tell us she what does. the setup is of Hustlers and Empire. So it's a multimedia presentation with giant video screens. And dialogue, giant and music, giant video screens. There's a series of six monologues that I wrote in collaboration with my performers and the original text, Iceberg Slim's text, Pimp, Marguerite Duras' story, The Lover, about being prostituted out by her mother early on to support the family, and this obscure Edgar Allan Poe story called Never Bet the Devil Your Head, as it's filtered through Federico Fellini in the film Toby Dan. Holy moly, did you leave anybody out? <laughs> That's what I love about you. So we've you. got, yeah, we've so got we've Fellini got to Iceberg Slim. I mean, this makes total sense yeah. to me. We have religion, religion, racism, sexism, wow. and classism, and it's all in there. And 
My other performers, in addition to Shannon, are the incredible John Kelly. All right, who's been performing for decades on the New York scene and, and elsewhere. Absolutely. He's an icon and just brought everything to this piece. And Viva Ruiz, who is a New York Latinx artist and activist who's incredible. So each of the performers wrote two original songs based on their character. And then I wrote monologues that they all performed. So they're all kind of caught on this surreal talk show, talking about what it means to be a hustler. And then it sort of breaks off into these songs and monologues. One of your first things you did that you got recognition for was called Blood Sisters which was a film about the leather dyke scene in San Francisco. I mean, what made you at that point until this day continue to work on these subjects, which are basically outsider but also queer? I work with a lot of people that do not define their sexuality and that dress in drag or that they're outside of everything. I don't even need a definition for what I am or what they are, but what made you decide to go in that direction? Is it because they are some of the most oppressed, like we fought our way out of oppression just by refusing to be repressed and by being rebellious creative artists. What made you decide to continue to go in that direction? Because well, it's so important. Yeah. And well, I've always been bi. I had right. girlfriends in school. How about try, I, honey? I mean, hello. <laughs> How about when you're bi within yourself? Like when you're bi fractured, when you're as male as you are female and it's like, who's fucking who here, honey bunny? Well, I don't need to strap one on. Have you seen nothing? Carry on. I never thought of myself I, as, as feminine. I certainly knew I was female, and society told me I was female, and I knew I wasn't a man, but I, you know, my gender Who'd isn't that, be that confusing anyway? to me. Who'd but- want to be that anyway? I mean, look, I pity the men because most good men, sensitive men, creative men, have the burden of all the other asshole men Absolutely. on top of them, and they're bullied. And actually, men, we can't discount how bad, cool, creative men have it in the face of these swastika, Nike, white supremacist, pathological line grabbing by the pussy cunts that are out there. And I pity most people. But then again, I guess they don't have a 357. Queerness has been a part of my world, my identity, my sexuality, everything. And then very early on when I first started to show my work in the late 80s, None of the straight film right. festivals well, or venues would show it. This, right. No one wanted anything to do with it because it was sexual in some way, and it was made by a woman, and it was in your face. And so I found my home in queer film festivals. Again, spokesperson, civil rights activist for others. For the others. And I've always thought of myself as, as the part other. of the other. Exactly. Yes, I, I've never, like I said, I'm not female. I'm right. not male. Hello. I'm just a Again, human here, here we are. trying Another to get by. connective tissue between myself and Michelle. The project you're working on now, which you admitted, I mean, it's still in its formative stages. Delirium, it's Which, called. I mean, by the way, again, I've had a song called Delirium. Let's just get that straight. It has how many acts? Eight? The Blackout, the Orgy, the Come Down, the Release, Euphoria, Sleep, Death Control. At least those are like chapters in a book, but these are chapters in the multimedia presentation. What you're doing is so hauntingly beautiful. And you're, you gave a speech recently for Creative Capital because I guess they're helping to sponsor some of your work. And I really love this quote that when you're trying to excavate equilibrium at its core, we can always turn off our screens. But Delirium asks what we can't turn off. Is it possible to get outside of your body, to get outside of time? Another subject I often deal with. Does being part of a subculture bring you that much closer to the edge? Of course, because as a subculture, we are on the edge. And Delirium will open up a dialogue about the outsider agency and present through VR as a new subculture where queer bodies can use their outrage to break the silence and present our unruly and ungovernable selves as material for resistance. Now, that's just a beautiful quote that came directly out of your mouth at the creative capital presentation. 
which showed a bit of what you're trying to present with delirium, which is a 360 degree experience and also using virtual reality and really expanding the boundaries of the experiential when you go into this. And I mean, in dealing with delirium, which we're all into some degree or another, sometimes to the worst degree and sometimes to the best, because actually delirium is the state I seek most often, but rarely get to. Is it because I, I don't feel like it's because I'm in so much control or I have so much control, or maybe I'm just delirium itself. I don't know. I can't, I can't, I'm not sure about that, Michelle. I can't analyze you. No, but you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, you know exactly I what do. I'm saying. Because I think you feel kind of the same way. Yeah, there's, well, you know, there's this drive. And in fact, I read it in something I was reading by you recently. And you were saying, of course, most of the time I read you, I'm like, yes, I agree, Well, Lydia. everything that I've heard yeah. out of your mouth in the last few days in researching this interview, I was like, hello. But yes, there, thank you for saying that for me. Yeah, you, you were talking about escape. Travel right. and escape yeah. and wanting to, you know, escape. And and I, for many, many, many decades, that was my whole thing, I, my well, goal. Like, I thought I could find freedom through escape. Well, and then you realize you, you can't, can't escape yourself. <laughs> you can't escape but, yourself. But the proper form of escapism is when you realize that wherever you go, you're taking yourself with you. And if you love and understand yourself enough, you can escape. I mean, I'm a nomad. I've moved around my entire life, and I will continue to move around. And I love to escape into all forms of extracurricular, recreational activities that no one is privy to. Well, maybe one or two or you know, mm -hmm. more at the, t the right moments. Maybe the coven. It's a state that both can perplex and could liberate delirium, mm -hmm. you know? And also, I mean, uh, delirium is just a disease of the night is one of my quotes from one of my pieces. Yeah. Delirium is just a disease of the night. Yeah. And it has something, as we were talking about transgression and transcendence, it's somehow connected to that, but it's Absolutely. different. Right. It's different than transcendence delirium, I think, because it's more about being caught in this constant state of striving or, exactly. or well, movement and it's, um, or gluttony something. as well. I mean, yeah. because there are certain emotions that are gluttonous in themselves. I mean... Of course, we have gluttony. I think that trauma is gluttonous, that when you have been traumatized, you become very gluttonous. You need more than what most people will provide, but ultimately you need to fill that void within yourself. And that's also something that you talk about. That's something that also mentioned in Dark Matter. What is in your soul? Is it a vacuum? Is it something that repels? Or is it something that's absolutely indescribable, which some forms of want, I can't say they're indescribable because we've been describing them our whole entire lives. <laughs> so we've tried to find the voice and the images that actually describe that state of insatiability. Now, I don't feel like I'm in a state of insatiability now, but I have been there. Uh -huh. And I think that the only way that you can actually work out of that is first you have to go over the edge. You have to really jump off the cliff. You have to go to the nth of the nth. And then when you, I don't like to say reach bottom because I don't feel like I've re ever reached bottom, but when you reach the height and that the only next step might be possible death, as just fragile human bodies, we can only take so much. I mean, the mind is, you know, ever expandable. But then there comes a point where you have to actually detox from everything because otherwise you will appreciate nothing. That's been something I really had to work on is as an immense predating glutton, then you just have to go, enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's never enough anyway. So if it is never enough, then you better figure out how the simplest thing is going to be satisfactory. It's going to be beautiful. Because for some reason, you've gone beyond the beyond. So now you have to go below the below. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you use beauty in your work when you're describing these painful or traumatic or outside dispositions that these people occupy. It's, and I, I find that really fantastic. Thank you. A lot of beauty in your work and humor. Yeah. I mean, I have and, a lot of humor in my work, but, you know, I'm the only one usually fucking laughing, but that's the way it is. <laughs> I'm this always is the, laughing. Well, because you fucking get it. <laughs> now, another thing that we share is you're a tenured professor. I merely teach workshops, and I taught one semester at the San Francisco Art Institute, which I'm quite proud of as a high school dropout. But I think it's really important workshops 
or, or to be in a teaching position because, you know, when I taught at the San Francisco Art Institute, I did not allow any criticism. You had to find something you liked because there's too much fucking criticism. And people would not imagine that I would be anti-criticism. All the people I've collaborated with, my job is to like be the cheerleader, be the den mother. I want to encourage them to do the best. I never insult. Um, that is not my goal. I wouldn't be able to collaborate with so many people. And I think that teaching in some respects is a collaborative process. And I think it's so important, especially when school on so many levels sucks so badly in this country. I know it's hard work and it's underpaid, but you got this year off, don't you? <laughs> I love that laugh. <laughs> you bring up a good point because some of the things that really changed my life were things I saw when I was in school. Some weirdo teacher played a John Waters film. Right. And, and it can, changed my and life. I can imagine you're changing a lot of people's lives. Beth B. teaches. Yeah. Kemra Fowler teaches. I teach the workshops. I think it's especially important for female creative artists to just help others in our stubbornness and our resistance and our rebellion and also to let them know, look, it ain't going to be fucking easy, kids. Mm -hmm. You know, people ask me, what do you say to young musicians or artists? I'm like, don't do it. Become a scientist. I was very happy that Miss World was a scientist. Just Miss World. I think it's Miss World. Scientist. That was Become awesome. a scientist or an yeah. architect. Forget the music and the art. But I think it's an important job, and I thank you for doing it, because even if it's one or two people's lives, the person that changed my life was my 10th grade teacher who told me, you don't belong here, to that which I said, you're right, goodbye, and walked out the door. So I have to say that a teacher changed my life, too. It's important. It's important. We look forward to your coming exhibitions. I suggest that people just look up Michelle Handelman online, go to YouTube. There's some things up there. There's a lot more to come, and I can't website. wait for our the website, michellehandelman.com. Dot com. I would say dot cunt, but I think we need to. Dot cunt. That's going to be the next one. <laughs> uh, and look forward to our coming collaborations. Yes. Because. I can't wait. We're here together now. Yeah. I feel we've always been here anyway. It's kind of like the best form of no exit or... Um, I don't know if you remember that play by Michael McClure. It was a San Francisco playwright. Well, it was a play about Billy the Kid and Jane Harlow in heaven, and they hated each other. It's called The Beard. Anyway, nobody knows that but me. It doesn't matter. This has been The Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunge and Michelle Handelman. 